Audiolivro Bom presents Becoming Woman by Felix Guattari In the global social field, homosexualities function somewhat as movements, chapels with their own ceremonial, their initiation rites, their myths of love, as René Nelly puts it. Despite the intervention of groupings of a more or less corporatist nature like Arcadia, homosexuality continues to be tied to the values and interactional systems of the dominant sexuality. Its dependence in regard to the heterosexual norm is manifested in a politics of the secret, a hiddenness nourished by repression, as well as by a feeling of shame still lively in respectable milieus, particularly among businessmen, writers, showbiz people, etc., in which psychoanalysis is presently the reigning master. It enforces a second-degree norm, no longer moral, but scientific. Homosexuality is no longer a moral matter, but a matter of perversion. Psychoanalysis makes an illness of it, a developmental retardation, a fixation at the pregenital stage, etc. On another, smaller and more avant-garde level is found militant homosexuality of the FHR type. Homosexuality confronts heterosexual power on its own terrain. Now heterosexuality must account for itself. The problem is displaced, phallocratic power tends to be put into question. In principle, a conjunction between the actions of feminists and homosexuals then becomes possible. However, we should perhaps distinguish a third level, a more molecular one, in which categories, groupings, and special instances would not be differentiated in the same way, in which clear-cut oppositions between types would be repudiated, in which, on the contrary, one would look for similarities among homosexuals, transvestites, drug addicts, sadomasochists, prostitutes, among women, men, children, teenagers, among psychotics, artists, revolutionaries, let's say among all forms of sexual minorities, once it is understood that in this realm there could only be minorities. For example, it could be said both at the same time, one, that all forms of sexuality, all forms of sexual activity are fundamentally on this side of the personological oppositions, homo-hetero, two, that nonetheless they are closer to homosexuality and to what could be called a feminine becoming. On the level of the social body, libido is caught in two systems of opposition, class and sex. It is expected to be male, phallocratic, it is expected to dichotomize all values. The opposition, strong and weak, rich and poor, useful and useless, clean and dirty, etc. Conversely, on the level of the sexed body, libido is engaged in a becoming woman. More precisely, the becoming woman serves as a point of reference and eventually as a screen for other types of becoming. Example, becoming child in Schumann, becoming animal in Kafka, becoming vegetable in Novalis, becoming mineral in Beckett. Becoming woman can play this intermediary role, this role as mediator vis-a-vis -vis other sexed becomings, because it is not too far removed from the binarism of phallic power. In order to understand the homosexual, we tell ourselves that it is sort of like a woman, and a number of homosexuals themselves join in this somewhat normalizing game. The pair feminine, passive, masculine, active therefore remains a point of reference made obligatory by power in order to permit it to situate, localize, territorialize, control intensities of desire. Outside of this exclusive bipole, no salvation. Or else it's the plunge into the nonsensical, to the prison, to the asylum, to psychoanalysis, etc. Deviance, various forms of marginalism, are themselves coded to work as safety valves. Women, in short, are the only official trustee of a becoming sexed body. A man who detaches himself from the phallic types inherent in all power formations will enter such a becoming woman according to diverse possible modalities. It is only on this condition, moreover, that he will be able to become animal, cosmos, letter, color, music. Homosexuality, by the very nature of things, cannot be dissociated from a becoming woman, even non-edipal, non-personological homosexuality. The same holds true for infantile sexuality, psychotic sexuality, poetic sexuality. For instance, the coincidence, in Allen Ginsberg's work, of a fundamental poetic mutation together with a sexual mutation. In a more general way, every dissident organization of libido must therefore be directly linked to a becoming feminine body, as an escape route from the repressive socius, 
as a possible access to a minimum of sexed becoming and as the last boy vis-à-vis the established order. I emphasize this last point because the becoming feminine body shouldn't be thought of as belonging to the woman category found in the couple, the family, etc. Such a category only exists in a specific social field that defines it. There is no such thing as woman per se, no maternal pole, no eternal feminine. The man-woman opposition serves as a foundation to the social order before class and caste conflicts intervene. Conversely, whatever shatters norms, whatever breaks from the established order, is related to homosexuality or a becoming animal or a becoming woman, etc. Every semiotization in rupture implies a sexualization in rupture. Thus, to my mind, we shouldn't ask which writers are homosexual, but rather what it is about a great writer, even if he is in fact heterosexual, that is homosexual. I think it's important to destroy big notions like woman, homosexual. Things are never that simple. When they're reduced to black-white, male-female categories, there's an ulterior motive, a binary reductionist operation meant to subjugate them. For example, you cannot qualify a love univocally. Love in Proust is never specifically homosexual. It always has a schizoid, paranoid component, a becoming plant, a becoming woman, a becoming music. Orgasm is another overblown notion whose ravages are incalculable. Dominant sexual morality requires of the woman a quasi-hysterical identification of her orgasm with the man's, an expression of symmetry, a submission to his phallic power. The woman owes her orgasm to the man. In refusing him, she assumes the guilt. So many stupid dramas are based on this theme, and the sententious attitude of psychoanalysts and sexologists on this point doesn't really help. In fact, it frequently happens that women who, for some reason or other, are frozen with male partners achieve orgasm easily by masturbating or having sex with another woman, but the scandal would be much worse if everything is out in the open. Let's consider a final example, the prostitute movement. Everyone, or just about, at first yelled, Hurrah! Prostitutes are right to rebel. But wait, you should separate the good from the bad. Prostitutes? Okay, but pimps? People don't want to hear about them. And so prostitutes were told that they should defend themselves, that they're being exploited, etc. All that is absurd. Before explaining anything whatsoever, one should first try to understand what goes on between a whore and her pimp. There's the whore-pimp money triangle. But there also is a whole micropolitics of desire, extremely complex, which is played out between each pole in this triangle and various characters like the John and the Cop. Prostitutes surely have very interesting things to teach us about these questions, and instead of persecuting them, it would be better to subsidize them as they do in research laboratories. I'm convinced, personally, that in studying all this micropolitics of prostitution, one might shed some new light on whole areas of conjugal and familial micropolitics, the money relations between husband and wife, parents and children, and ultimately, the psychoanalyst and his patient. We should also recall what the anarchists of the turn of the century wrote on the subject.